There's a story from the Middle Ages about a friar, a preaching, traveling friar who had many long distances to go. And a wealthy merchant at the time took pity on him and bought him a donkey. And the friar was just so excited to test out this donkey. So the next day he got on the donkey and traveled to the neighboring town, uh, parked the donkey outside the church and went in to preach. But all through the service, the friar was really distracted. Is my donkey okay? <laughs> Did I secure the tether properly? Is it in a safe enough place? Does it have enough water to drink? And on and on, this friar ruminated about how safe was his donkey going to be. Eventually, the service ended. He went outside, and all this needless worry uh, was, it was needless because the donkey was absolutely fine. Everything was well. But he realized something had changed. There was a new danger in his life. So what did he do? He untied the donkey, gave it a slap on its rear end, <laughs> and let it go free, <laughs> saying, God forbid that my soul should be tethered to this donkey. In that worship service, the friar knew that he had to give away the lesser in order to focus on the greater, which is life in the presence of God, lived in the presence of God. And I think this story about the friar sums up why one of the non-negotiables in God's kingdom is there's good news for the poor, good news for the poor. Because it's true, isn't it, that those who live with very little possessions, those who live in deep poverty, often have the greatest view of God. There's no doubt about it. When I first arrived in Kenya many years ago to, to live there and work in Nairobi, uh, the day I arrived, the banks all declared that they were going on strike. So you couldn't go to an ATM and just pull out money. Everything was shut down. And initially, they thought it would just be for a couple of days. But it went on for three weeks. No money circulating for, for three weeks. Uh, and the community did something amazing. They practiced what they call it in Kiswahili, Harambe, which simply means we all pull together, Harambe. And there was an um, unbelievable amount of sharing uh, and generosity in those three weeks. Even to me, a stranger newly arrived in the country, people kept asking, are you okay? Do you have everything you need? And I think that gets at this jubilee principle. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about jubilee, celebrating our 50 years as a congregation. And today, it's this good news for the poor, Deuteronomy 11. It says in Deuteronomy 11 that every seven years, debts are to be canceled in order to break the cycles of poverty. This is the reset mechanism. And Yahweh offers two motivations for this reset in verse 4. He says, you know, my vision for this world is that there shouldn't be anyone who's poor. That's the ideal. That's what we're aiming for. No one should be poor. But then there's a second motivation in verse 4. God says, you've been brought to a land of abundance, full of goodness, and this abundance should enable you to be kind and generous to everyone else. And throughout Deuteronomy 11, this generosity is elucidated on. God says there might be some very cunning and sly people in your community who think, well, we're on year six and someone's asking me to, to give them a loan. But in year seven, 
This debt is going to be canceled. Why should I do that? And Yahweh says, give anyway, because every day should be this generous day. And this guards against people becoming twisted and ingrown and selfish. And verse 10 ends with that beautiful statement that the more we keep our hands open, the more we keep our hearts soft to our neighbor, the more we identify with who God is. This is God's character. God loves to bless the world in an open-hearted and open-handed, generous way. That's jubilee. That's good news for the poor. However, I wonder, as you read Deuteronomy 11, were there some phrases that just jarred with you? I know that they did for me. It doesn't take long to detect problems in the text. Verse 2 and 3 makes this explicit that these rules of, of debt recovery are purely for the benefit of the Israelites, no one else. It doesn't apply to foreigners. Only those who have this shared common memory of Exodus, only those who had the shared memory of traveling through the wilderness, only those who had the, the shared memory of the gift of the promised land, they're only going to benefit. So that by the time you get to verse 7, it seems entirely exclusive. When the Lord your God has blessed you as promised, you'll lend to many nations, but you'll not borrow. You'll rule over many nations, and they're not going to rule over you. What's going on? Now, on the one hand, you can balance it out and say, well, culturally, there's a redressing of balance here. This provision of debt cancellation is good because it's much more than what was happening in Egypt where debt slaves lived in perpetual bondage. They never got out. There was never any hope. And also this provision of debt cancellation is more than what the Mesopotamian countries were practicing where they only practiced debt release when a new king came. And the new king, in order to ingratiate himself to his community, pronounced debt release. But it only happened then. It wasn't a cycle. It wasn't a rhythm. So there are dimensions in which this is good. It's also good because Yahweh was saying, what happens in your interior must match your exterior. You can't be hard-hearted and tight-fisted, but you must be open-hearted and open-handed. It's a realignment of heart and head. So all these things are good, except Deuteronomy feels exclusive. For Israel to rule over many nations seems to teeter on exceptionalism. It seems to teeter on domination. And that's why we need to keep traveling through Jubilee, through the prophets, through to the New Testament. We need to see how it shows up in Isaiah 61. Because the people there may have been living in the promised land in Jerusalem, but they have just experienced exile. And they return to this holy city and they see it in ruins. It's impoverished. It's poor, where walls quite literally need to be rebuilt. And, and you can sense that the Israelites are just desperately clinging on to hope, to all those ancient covenant promises, because that experience of exile has made them turn sour. Exile, this experience that has stripped them of everything that's familiar. Exile where dreams of being successful now seem so fragile. Exile where temple worship and rituals have been so dismantled, people are wondering, is God still here? Is God still with us? It's one thing to live in exile from your own home country and to experience all that stripping away of the familiar. 
It's a whole other enterprise to experience exile when you haven't left your native city. This past few weeks, more than a few people have commented how it feels that since the pandemic and after Synod, it feels like church can be a place of exile. It's no longer familiar. It's a place of dismembering ancient covenant promises hanging by a thread. The tragedy of Isaiah 61 in this place of fragile exile that they're still coming to terms with. Isaiah was trying to breathe in, trying to massage into them this living hope that urban social renewal can happen in Jerusalem again. It can happen deep within your bones. But the only way it can happen is if you're kind to the poor. It's not about being selfish. But the tragedy is the people didn't live that way. Instead, they began to separate out what's mine is not yours. They separated out the sacred and the secular. On the one hand, they were piously praying and and fasting for God to be near, and at the same time they were oppressing their hired workers and not acting justly. Their exile experience made them tight-fisted, closed, isolated, faction-led, hard-hearted, And that's why Isaiah continued to say, is not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to let the oppressed go free. Isaiah kept saying, remember, remember who you are. Remember whose you are. That you were once oppressed in Egypt and you were set free by the liberator God. Live that way. You were once wandering in the wilderness and every single day God showed up to give you manna. Live that way. You were led to this promised land of abundance. Now live that way. Live abundantly. So maybe this experience of exile was this poignant reminder to hold on to what is great about God and let go of the lesser. To remember All these good things came from God's hand, not because they were a people of worth, not because they were exceptional, but it was simply because God is love. God loved them. Yahweh delighted in giving this uprooted people a place of security and a place of identity. So maybe it's good to be in exile for a while. Not to be dismembered, but to remember all the wonderful things that God is to us. And that God can do it again. Isaiah said it's going to take nothing less than the heavens to be rend apart. And for the Messiah, the anointed one, to come down in this new epoch of grace. And God did. God opened up the heavens. And Jesus came as a man. And so, in Luke 4, on that Sabbath day, when Jesus took that scroll and opened up Isaiah 61 and said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me now to preach good news to the poor. Today, not in the future, but today the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Jesus was saying, Jubilee has come. Jubilee has come in human form to restore the broken, the fallen, the needy, to reverse every form of bondage. Jubilee has come in the form of a savior who is now in exile, who is now poor, who was born in a borrowed manger. His parents were so poor that when they took him as a baby to be circumcised, all they could offer were pigeons the poorest of the poor. All through his adult life, he owned no home. Foxes of holes, the birds of the air of nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And dying, when he, when he died, he was even in a borrowed grave. 
didn't own anything. Also that God's purposes of shalom might be rekindled and reborn in us. That was the good news to the people in Nazareth that day. It is possible, but only through Jesus. It was good news to the people in Nazareth who were still being oppressed by Roman rule. They weren't free, but this was the balm they needed to their deepest of needs. It wasn't just a spiritual panacea to get them through, but it was a fulsome, holistic healing of the world, material as well as spiritual, present as well as future. And so the people in Nazareth couldn't hold this gospel because it was too small. And Jesus begins to take it further. They were pleased when they heard Jesus say all these things. They thought, this is good news for the people in Nazareth. But then Jesus began to stretch them in their faith. Jesus begins to talk about the prophet Elijah, how he went out to Zarephath and met this widow who was poor and raised the son to life. This wasn't a Jew. Jesus talks about Elisha, Healing Naaman, the Syrian, who was a leper. Naaman wasn't a Jew. And so Jesus says, when I come and bring Jubilee, it's not just for the Jews. It's for everyone. Elijah was good news to the poor widow. He brought her food. He helped her son be raised to life. Elisha was good news to Naaman, the Syrian, But you might say, well, hold on, wasn't Naaman rich? He was this powerful military leader. Is this good news to the poor? How is that? But do you remember the story how Naaman had to climb down from his position? He had to get rid of this, I can fix myself mentality. He needed to go down into the river, the filthy river Jordan, to be healed. And to follow these rules of exile that he had no agency, he had no choice, he had no power. He had simply to trust in the full agency and power of Yahweh and in what God can do. In other words, Naaman had to climb down and become poor too, trusting God would save him. And so if Jesus is this good news, if Jesus is living water, think of how living water, when it falls on the ground, it trickles down into the earth to the lowest point, always to the lowest point. That's the gospel. It brings good news to the people who are right at the bottom, to the ones who realize they have nothing of value to bring into the kingdom, They're simply relying on the total wealth of somebody else, the abundance God can bring, so that God raises up the voice of the poor again. And when the Jews in Nazareth heard that, they wanted to kill him. That was just too much for them to hear. They wanted a Messiah all to themselves. He's ours. He's not anybody else's. It was scandalous, scandalous good news. Because the poor was now being redefined, not just in terms of material value, but by those who simply trusted in the good news of Jesus Christ, not in their own hard work. That's why it's always good news for the poor. It's too hard to get out of poverty because the reasons are just so complex, aren't they? They're economic, they're social, they're racial. And to hear a savior who's come to love and bring value when you don't feel valued, when you don't feel seen, when you're invisible. I'm sure every one of us this week in Grand Rapids has passed by a homeless person and we've turned away as if they don't exist. That's the stigma of poverty. But Jesus 
comes to see the ones we pretend are invisible and says, I see you. And this good news is available to you. No matter what boundaries need crossed, Jesus can cross it. Jubilee means good news for the poor. And this good news is so much bigger than any of us can hold for ourselves. But there's a hard question. The question remains, can we live with a jubilee that's for other people as well as ourselves? We like this idea, don't we? It's a good idea of jubilee. We like it in the same way the people of Nazareth like it. But when we hear about it happening in other places with other people, can we still join in? I want to finish with how the Jubilee story ends for one person, because there's always the sting. John the Baptist, later on in Luke, this faithful man of God, this faithful prophet, this messenger, he ends up in prison and he's beginning to wonder, Messiah, Jubilee, really? I'm in prison. And so he sends these words to Jesus, are you, are you it? Are you the one? And I'm sure we can all identify with what he's thinking. Can Jesus not just get me out of here? And Jesus sends the words back to him. The dead are raised. The poor have good news. The lepers are cleansed. Yes, I am the one. But for John, change doesn't come. He stays in prison. He dies in prison, and it seems so cruel. John was not wrong in expecting jubilee. He was not wrong in pronouncing the good news of the kingdom of justice and shalom. But John wanted it all at once, immediately. But Jesus was saying, Jubilee happens slowly sometimes, and that's hard. It's hard for us to bear because we want it all at once. And so I want to leave you with a challenge. Maybe some of you are in the first position of not expecting enough. You're like the people in exile in Isaiah 61. We've not really believed that God cares for real people who are oppressed and suffering, and so we simply pray lame prayers and nothing changes. We settle for this unbiblical, otherworldly list. I pray and hope things will get better in the end, but it's a lame prayer without hope. Jubilee says, expand your vision. The good news is for all people. But then there's others of us who've been faithfully proclaiming jubilee like John, but we want it immediately. We want it now. And then we're a little bemused when jubilee happens over here to our neighbor, and it's touching people in surprising ways that we couldn't expect or predict, and we begin to feel a little bit jealous. How do we get back to cultivating this healthy balance of jubilee? Well, I think the answer is just through our rhythms, our rhythms of Sabbath, our rhythms of rest, our rhythms of how we give, our rhythms of pause and stopping long enough so that the world is not about us, but we begin to see what God is doing instead of what we need to do. I was moved by a story recently from one of our rabbis in Grand Rapids, Rabbi Khrushchev. He's part of um, many clergy who are partnering with GRPD, the police department in the city, um, on clergy on patrol. And he began to connect how his Jewish Calendar rhythms are connecting him to the poor in the city. Listen to what he writes. In the rides I've taken with the Grand Rapids Police Department as part of the Clergy on Patrol program, I've learned 
that when officers interview people from poor areas of the city, the question, where do you live, doesn't always elicit a useful response. Often people who encounter police officers don't have a home. They don't live anywhere. So in order to get an address, the officer instead asks, where do you stay? Because the four walls are always changing, the bed and the couches, they rotate. It doesn't feel like a home they live in, but rather a place that they stay till they find the next place to stay. And so the Jewish rhythms that we practice, the holiday of Sukkot, this is the tabernacling holiday, which has just been occurring in Jewish tradition, cultivates that kind of rootlessness, that kind of exile, if you like. And we make these temporary shelters made out of materials from the land. And on a glorious sunny day or a crisp cloudless night, it's wonderful to go into that shelter and share a meal. Once a year for seven days, it's our mitzvah to uproot ourselves from our home and stay for meals at least in the sukkah. It's a gratitude practice. It's a reminder not to take our home, our comfort, our security for granted. It's a reminder of the fragility of our lives and how much we still need God and other people for support. I find that so challenging, how our worship practices help us lean in to identifying with the poor. And in a moment, you're going to be invited to leave your seats, to leave your comfort, to leave what you're holding on to, and instead grab the bread and take hold of the wine and embody this remembering of our family ties together, that in Christ we are greater. And laying down all the places where we miss the mark by trying to find our worth. And instead, we grab hold of the pearl of great price, Jesus himself, and find ultimate value in the family of Jesus Christ, the one who became exile for us, the one who became poor for us, so that we might be anchored in the great riches of Christ. Have you made God too small? Cultivate practices and rhythms of jubilee that will instill hope. Have you got impatient with God that there's not enough justice now? Practice rhythms of jubilee that cultivate deep contentment. And once you see the Messiah loosing the chains of injustice, the promise from Isaiah is this. Then your light will break forth like dawn. Your healing will quickly appear. Righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Good news for the poor. Good news indeed. So practice jubilee. In the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit.